hello guys welcome back to my channel today we're going to be looking at the may 2019 cxc mathematics paper one or the cxc 2019 multiple choice let's get right into it and we start here with question one now question one is asking me to find the value of negative three all squared added to negative two all squared now this is a question about bit maths once we see this we know we're going straight to bit maths right which brackets indices division multiplication addition and then subtraction all right so let's start with my brackets what does negative three square means it means it's going to be negative three multiplied by negative three added to negative two squared which means negative two multiplied by negative two now we all know that before we can do addition we're going to have to take care of the multiplication right now we all know that whenever you multiply a negative by a negative we're going to get a positive so this is going to give me a positive 9 added to a positive 4. now notice we had to multiply before we add all right then we know that 9 plus 4 would give me positive 13 which makes my answer b as in boy question number two what number when added to one and one third gives two all right first of all what it means is that I could go 2 minus 1 and 1 third. That's how I would know what number to add to this to get 2. All right? We can start by taking out the whole from the 2, which is going to leave me with 1. And I'm going to have to subtract 1 third from that. All right? So we took away the 1, which leaves me with 1. Now, what does 1 third mean? It means that I have a whole that I divide into 3 equal parts, which means that I can write 1 as 3 thirds. Right? And I want to take away one third so we if we have three equal parts and we take out one part then of course i'm going to have two parts left out of three parts which is the same as saying two thirds right no that makes my answer b as in boy question number three it says 11.1 .1 divided by 0 0.01 is equal to what do i do with this now, typically in math, we don't normally divide by a decimal because that makes life more complicated unless you have a calculator. So my job is to get rid of my decimal. But this is it. Maths work like this. It's like equilibrium. If I want to get rid of the decimal, I would have to multiply by 100. But to keep the balance, I would also have to multiply the dividend by 100, right? So if you multiply the divisor by 100, you multiply the dividend by 100. When I take this quotient, the answer remains the same as if I had used a decimal, right? Now, when divide, when multiplying by 100, we know exactly what happens, right? So easy. What we do is that we can move two. First and so we move two places. So imagine if we were to move two places, it would be one. I add a zero, then that gives me. So I would have 1,110 divided by. Look at what happens when I move two places here. If I go, let me just get back my pen. If I go 1, 2, I'm dividing by 1, right? Now, what happens when I divide a number by 1? The number is unaffected, which means I get 1,110, which makes my answer B as in dog. All right, guys, question 4. It says 12.5% of a sum of money is parted as what is the sum of money? All right. Now, 12.5% seems like an unfamiliar fraction, but guess what? 12.5 is actually a half of 25%. Very important to note, all right? So, what it means is this. If I find a half of 25%, it becomes 12.5%. Now, there are some common fractions that we must always know, right? So, for example, 50% is a half, which is the same as 0 0.5. 25% is a quarter which is the same as 0 0.25, and that goes on, all right? Now, if I find a half of 25%, it's going to be 12 and a half percent. And of course, guess what? When I find a half of a fraction, all we have to do is to multiply my denominator by 2, all right? So in this case, I simply multiply 4 by 2, which becomes 1 8. Good. So we know that one eighth of a sum of money is equal to forty dollars. 
Now, how do I find that amount of money? Pretty much, we do the reciprocal. So if one part out of eight parts is equal to 40, then I can find what eight parts is equal to. All right? One part is 40. Eight parts must be eight multiplied by 40. Now, four times eight is 32. And of course, we put back the zero there, which makes this answer $320. All right? Pretty straightforward. Now, please read carefully, because some persons would have probably gone ahead and think that this said find 12.5% of 40. All right? You have to read carefully. All right, let's take this down to question number five. It says a test was marked out of 80, right? A boy scored 60% of the marks on this test. How much marks did he score? All right. Percentage means per 100, right? So it's going to be 60 over 100 multiply them by the amount that we want to apply it to which in this case is 80 so in other words we want to find 60 percent of 80. now what is easy about this is that whenever we have numbers that end with zero we can actually divide them by 10 which is equivalent to just simply crossing out the zeros so this zero takes that zero this zero takes that zero all right and then we go six times eight which would be 48. what it means is that he got 48 correct out of 80 marks, which is reflective of a 60%. That's pretty much how we work that part out, all right? Let's take it over to question number six. All right, let me scroll up here. All right. This says the square root of 181 lies between. Now, pretty much this is about knowing your timetable, right? So, Let's start with the simple numbers. It could not be between 9 and 11, right? Because that if I square 9 and I square 11, that's going to give me 81 and 121, right? So that's out of it. Now, if I get this here when I square these small numbers, can you imagine what I get when I square 45 and 46? That's out. Elimination. All right. What about 11 and 13? Now, we know that if we square 11 that's 121 and if we square 13 then that is going to be 169 hmm? so that is out which means that there is only one answer remaining which is question or answer number a all right so sometimes you have to rule out certain things which means that technically you have to know your timetable all right your timetable is what is going to assist you here Number seven, which of the following set of numbers is defined as the set of x where x is a member of integers such that x is great. And remember, whenever you have it like this, you read it from the middle, right? x is greater than or equal to negative two, but less than or equal to four. In, we know in integers represent negative numbers, positive numbers. Now, if it's going to be greater than or equal to negative two, it means that negative two is a part of it. And it's going to be less than or equal to 4, 4 is a part. So we need all the numbers or all the integers from 2 up to 4, which is inclusive of negative 2 and 4. Of course, there's only one option. And if I consider all the integers, I'm going to have negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. So right now we're looking strictly at D. All right? There are no other options. All right, let's go down some more. It says if Q is equal to the set of a b and c how many subsets can be obtained from set q now this is a formula that we should all know right the number of subsets is equal to 2 raised to the n where n represents how many elements i have inside of my bracket inside of this bracket i currently have three elements so it becomes 2 to the third power which is option number d as in dog Number nine, item nine refers to the following Venn diagram, all right? So we have the universal set, we have P, and we have Q. It says in the Venn diagram, the number of elements in P is five, the number of elements in Q is nine, and the number of elements in P union Q. Now, P union Q is all of this, right? So all of this is going to be 10. When I combine both sets, which is my union, it's going to be 10. But they are saying that the number in P is 5. But we have to remember that the intersection is a part of it, right? So 
we have five here. You know, this five is refractive of both P here only and the intersection. And in Q, we have nine. Now, whatever is in the intersection will be counted twice. It's counted when you count P and it's counted when you count Q. So what is the simple solution? We simply add both of these, which is nine plus five, which gives me 14. And since the union, when you combine both of them, you should be getting 10. It tells me that the amount that is over is what should be inside of my intersection, right? So when I go 14 and I subtract 10, I know that I have four more, which means the intersection will have been counted twice. So, and guess what? They're asking you for how much is in the intersection, which turns out to be four. Right, let's go to my next page and I'm now at question 10. And remember, I can't use a calculator, but you can use techniques to work this out. All right, here we have P, which item term refers to the following information P is a set of prime numbers, Q is a set of odd numbers, and R is a set of even numbers. Which of the following set is empty? All right, we know that there are some specific information about prime numbers. So we know that most prime numbers are actually odd numbers that we know. We know that there's a special number that is both prime and even, and that's the only one, and that's number two. Now, the numbers that don't have anything in common would be odd and even. They can't have an odd number that is even. That's out of it. So if we want an empty set, we're looking for the set that has Q intersect R, right? There's nothing in that intersection. So we're looking for Q intersect R which turns out to be B, which is boy. All right, question 11. Now, it says P is equal to 2, 3, 5, and 7. Q is equal to 2, 3, and 6. S is equal to 2, 4, and 5. Now, we want what is intersection means what is common. So, it's asking you what is common to all three. That is what it really means. So, if I'm looking carefully here, I realize that what? 2 is common to all three sets. So that is what I would have selected. Right? Just remember that intersection means what is common. All right, item 12 refers to the following Venn diagram. It says in the Venn diagram, the shaded area represents. All right, now notice that what we have shaded is everything outside of P. Right? Everything outside of P is shaded. So we have nothing in P shaded. Now, by saying nothing in P, there's something we call complement, which means not. If it's not P, it means that um, it's outside of P, which is the same as saying P complement, right? That is what this symbol here means. It means not P. As we can see, not P is shaded. Nothing inside of P is shaded. It's outside of P, which means a complement of P. Complement is just a way of saying not. All right, let me take this back up to question number 13, which we have at the top here. All right, it says if Trinidad $6 is equivalent to US dollar, one is equivalent to one US dollar, then Trinidad $15 is in US is equal to. All right, clearly we can see that the US has a higher value than Trinidad value dollars, right? Because it takes what? Six Trinidad dollars just to make one US dollars. So if I have 15 Trinidad dollars, what do I do? Right now, this is telling me that I'm gonna have to divide 15 by six, right? Since we know that one gives me, one US dollar gives me six Trinidad dollars, right? Now, how many times can six go into 15? We know that this can go two times. The remainder is three which goes over my divisor, which is six. So we have two and three, six. But guess what? Three is half of six. So it's gonna be 2.5. And since we're talking about currency, we simply add on zero, which makes it $2.50. All right. Question number 14. If $7,000 is borrowed at a rate of 5% per annum for three years, the simple interest is? Now, simple interest, we know it's the principal multiplied by the rate, multiplied by the time, all over 
100. All right, my principal here is 7,000, right? My rate is 5% and my time is three years. Time must be in years, over 100. Now, once again, we have a choice of eliminating by powers of 10. So this zero takes that, this takes that. Now, whenever a number ends with a zero and you're multiplying, you can ignore that zero because that zero is going to go back at the end, right? So you can put the zero for the end. All right, let me not go all the way down there since we're going to need the space down there for the next question. So ignore the zero. Once a number ends with zero, it will, the answer will end with zero. All right. So we go 7 times 5, which we know is going to be 35, right? And then we're going to have to multiply 35 by 3. All right. So 3 fives. 15, put the 5 and carry the 1, 3, 3 is 9 and 1, 10, so I'm going to have 105, and bear in mind that that 0 from the 70 comes back at the end, which makes it $1,050, all right, interesting, number 15, all right, let's see what happens here. It says that a dress which costs $180 is being sold at a discount of 10%. The amount of the discount is, so how much is my discount going to be? No, I, want, I don't want you to mix this up with the discounted price. The discounted price would be how much I'm selling the dress for after I take off the 10%. The discount is how much I take off. So that's going to be, once again, it's percentage. It's 10 over 100. As percent means per 100, right? Multiplied by 180. Once again, numbers are ended zero. We can divide by powers of 10. Yeah? That takes this out, which leaves me with $18. So that makes my option, option C as in cat. Let's take it down, down, down. All right, let's move on to question number 16. The value of a plot of land is $18,000. Land tax is charged at a rate of 70 cent per 100 value. What's the total amount paid of tax paid for the land? All right. What is it saying? What? It's saying that for every $100 that the land is valued at, I'm going to be paying 70 cent for that. So all I have to do is find out how much $100 can I get from 18000 once again, that makes the thing easy. So I have 18,000. I want to find how much $100 is in 18,000 because I'm going to be paying 70 cents per $100, right? So I need to find how much is in there, right? We divide by powers of 10. So now we have 180, and we're going to have to multiply that by 70 cents, right? So 0 0.70. Now, guess what? If, if I multiply any number by zero, it's still going to be zero, right? So it's going to be unaffected completely. All we have to try to do is focus on multiplying by the seven here. All right, so let's see what happens. Now, ignore the point. The point is not necessary at the moment. So we say seven times zero is zero. And of course, this is where we say you have to know your timetable, right? Seven times eight is 56. We put a six and we carry the five. 7 times 1 is 7, and if we add 5, we get 12. Now, how do I know where the point goes? We simply count how much decimal points are in the numbers that we multiply, right? So we had 1, 2. So we have to count off 1, 2, which takes this right here. All right, let me just remove this right here. All right. Good. So this zero that was right here, whenever you initially use it, so we said that zero times anything is still zero. So we'll have put the zero at the end just to count it if we wanted to do something like that. Or if I were to take it out, I didn't have to use it, I could have taken it out. So I would have to count one decimal place, right? So we have to be careful right there. So I almost put it here because we never accounted for that zero. So we simply count off two places from the right. So that's one, two, which makes it here, 126, right? So my answer is B. However, what I could have done is to know that zero times anything is zero. That wouldn't affect anything. So I wouldn't be putting that zero there as a placeholder. So that's why we have to be careful. Now, 
when I multiplied, I would have gotten 1,000. Let me take this out. 1,260. And since I have one decimal place, I would have to put a point here. So that is a critical point that we have to be careful with right there. Right, we move on to question 17. Now, question 17 says, at the end of a year, a car is worth 5% less than what it was worth at the beginning of the year. If a car is worth 9,500 in December 2016, then its value in January of 2016 was. So in January 2016, it was worth more than it was worth in December 2016. It's worth 5% less. But there's something very important here that's going to make your life easy in working out the question. Now remember percentage means per 100, right? That's important. Now ignore these two zeros. As we tell you, you don't always need zeros to work things out. Good. So if I take off 5%, remember the initial value of the car is always 100%. If you take off 5%, the value of the car is now 95%. But well, guess what? 95% is equivalent to $95. So when I take off 5%, I have 95% left. And I have $95 left if I'm ignoring the zeros, which means that I would have taken off $5, right? Ignoring those two zeros. Now, guess what? Since we have found these two things to be equivalent, all I have to do is to put back the two zeros that I would have taken off, right? So 5% that was taken off was equivalent to $500, right? So that $500, I'm going to add to the value of the car now, which is $9,500. So it's $9,500 plus the $500 that would have been taken off, which takes me up to $10,000, right? You see how, how that made my life easier by just realizing that if I take off 5%, the value of anything is 100% by taking off 5%. I'm going to have 95% left. And by ignoring these two zeros, I have $95 remaining. Which means that since these are the same, 95%, $95. And we took off 5%, that 5% would also be equal to taking off $5. Right? And then, of course, you saw what we did there. We ignored the zeros. So once we put the $5, we now have to put on about the zeros. And that is typically why it's always easier to work with zeros. Number 18. A loan of $8,000 was paid in 24 equal monthly installments of 400. The rate of interest on the loan was. Alright, there are so many ways to do this. Now, one thing I can do, first of all, I could try to figure out how much I repaid in total. Alright? So, we have... 24 multiplied by 400. Now you might be asking, why am I putting the bigger number at the bottom? Because the bigger number has two zeros at the end, which makes it easier for me to multiply. So when I multiply everything by the first zero, it becomes zero. When I multiply everything by the second zero, still zero. And now I multiply by four, right? So four times four is 16. Put on the six, carry the one. Four two is eight and one is nine. That's 9,600, which means that since a loan was 8,000, my interest is actually 1,600, right? Now, all I'm asking you is what is this value as a percentage? Now, hmm, do I have to work it out? I don't technically have to work it out. Why? I know that 8,000, and that is why it's important to know these common fractions, right? 1,600 is almost 2,000. All right? 1,600 is almost 2,000. Why is that so important? Because 4 times 2,000 gives me 8,000. Now, what do I know? 4 quarters make a whole. And a quarter is the same as saying 25%. So, guess what? If 25% is 2,000, and I'm getting 1,600 here, which is a little less than 2,000, then that 1,600 must be equal to a little less than 25%, which means that my most logical answer would be 20%. So 
having knowledge of fractions, decimals, and percentage makes my life easier. On the flip side, if you don't want to do that, then I would just have to go ahead, take my interest, which is 1,600, put it over my original cost of my loan, which is 8,000, and multiply that by 100, as percentage means per 100, right? So we could have taken zeros, two zeros there. This takes this. And of course, 8 into 8 is 1, ignoring the 0. 8 into 16 is 2. 8 into 0 is 0. So that gives me 20%. Either way, this question, this works out pretty easy as well, right? So it's really up to you. But my advice is to know your common fractions, your common decimals, and your common percentages. It makes your life 10 times easier. All right, a dinner at a restaurant was advertised at $6 plus 18% tax, a total bill. All right, so once again, if I want, I could use my concept of percentage, which I'm going to show you that it does make your life easy, right? Now, 18% is close to 20%. Now, 20%, which means 20 over 100, is the same as one fifth, right? So technically, I could find one fifth of 60, and which is going to be 12 hours. So I know that if 20% is 12 hours, then I know mentally that 18% is just a little bit less than 12 hours, which means that if my value was 60, and I'm going up to a little bit less than 12 hours to be added to that, then I'm probably going to be adding ten dollars right which would take me to seven dollars and eighty cents so my most logical answer would be b you see how knowing percentage makes your life easier so 18 percent is close to 20 so i just simplify in 20 percent why because 20 percent is pretty easy to find 20 percent turns out to be 12 hours so i'm expecting 18 percent to be less and the only logical answer that is a little less is actually seventy dollars hmm. Now, if you don't want to do that, you can always go 18%, which is 18 over 100, multiply by 60, right? So, you can cancel your zeros. I could say 2 into 18 goes 9 times. 2 into 10 goes 5 times. I could say 9 times 6 is 54. And I could say... 5 times nothing is 5, right? Now, we have to be smart about how we do everything here. So I can say 5 into 54 goes 10, because you know 5 into 50 goes 10. And then you're going to have 4 divided by 5. Now, pretty much, because this is going to be a decimal, it's so easy to do. You simply put a decimal point, and you think of this as like you're adding a 0 to the 4. So it makes it 40. So 5 into 40 goes 8 times. And of course you get the same answer. $10.80, which you're going to be adding to your 60, which makes it $70.80. But my advice, once again, know the common decimals, know the common fractions. For the common percentages, look at percentages that are close. Like if you have 19% is close to 20, 20% 20 is easier to find. If you have 23%, it's close to 25%. 25% is easier to find. All right, question 20. At a sale, each book was marked at $3 off the original price. Daniel paid $46 for two books that had the same sale price. What was the original cost of the books? All right. Now, well, the original cost of one of his books, sorry. So, if you look at this, it says the book was each marked 3% off the original price. And Daniel paid $46 for two books that had the same sale price. So, pretty much all I have to do is divide that by 2. So, if I divide 46 by 2, I'm going to get 23, right? And then, of course, that would have been 3% off. Or, no, not 3%, my bad. $3 off. So, I just need to add back that $3, right? So plus 3, which is going to give me $26. Right? Well, nothing too complicated there. All right, and that's our question 20. 
we now go up to question number 21. All right, let's see. So we have 1 over 5x, and we want to add that to 2 over 3x. Now, here we're going to have to find my LCM, all right? Now, since they both have an x in common, we don't have to really pay attention to that. x is common, so you can put by the x. That's what it means by lowest common multiple, the lowest number that both can go into. We have an x right there. Now, for 5 and 3, that's not common, so the LCM for 5 and 3 is 15. All right, good. Now, we don't need to pay attention to the x because x into x will always go one time. So we say 5 into 15 goes 3. 3 times my numerator is 3. 3 into 15 goes 5. And 5 times 2 is 10. So here I'm going to end up with 13 over 15x, which makes my answer option D as in dog. All right, number 22. When 5 is added to a certain number, the result and the result is multiplied by 3, the final answer is 27. What is the original number? Now, do exactly what they say. When 5 is added to a certain number, we don't know the number, we can call it x. So we add 5 to x, right? The final result, since, and this is why brackets are important, this result, which is all of this, has to be multiplied by 3. Now, it doesn't matter where I put the 3. I could put times 3 at the front or times 3 at the back. But let's go with what persons know or feel more comfortable with. So it says when I multiply all of this by 3, the result I'm going to get is 27. So you equate it to 27. What is the original number? None. You can use trial and error here. We could expand this, which would be a waste of time. Or we can just start doing the opposite. Which since I'm multiplying everything by 3, just divide everything by 3, right? So x plus 5 is equal to 3 into 27 is 9. I need to subtract 5 from both sides to keep this balance. So I get x to be 4. So that makes it option A, as in apple. Number 23. All right. Let's see what we make of this. Um, what is the value of, oh, we have an expression here, x squared plus 3y over x all over xy. If x is 4, y is 2. This is a matter of replacement. So I'm going to replace an x by 4. So that's 4 squared plus 3 times y and y is 2 over xy, which means 4 times 2, right? We use a dot. We can use a dot as a multiplication symbol in the middle there. Now, what does 4 square mean? It means 4 times 4, which is 16. 3 times 2 is 6. And 4 times 2 is 8. Remember your order of operation, right? Bid mass. Now, 16 plus 6 is going to give me 22, right? over 8, which of course, since it's a fraction, you can break it down, right? 2 can go into both of them, so we have 11 over 4. Now, how many times does 4 go into 11? We know that's going to be 2 times, and 2 times 4 is 8, so 8, 9, 10, 11, so you have a remainder of being 3, so it's 2 and 3 quarters. Once again, we have option D as in dog. Question 24. If x is an integer that satisfies the inequality 2x is greater than 4 but less than or equal to 6, then, of course, we treat this like a typical equation, right? You have 2x in the middle, greater than 4, less than or equal to 6. We need to know what x, the range of x is. So we're going to have to divide by 2, but that means everything must be divided by 2, right? So this becomes, since it's a positive 2, everything remains the same, right? 2 into 4 is 2, and 2 into 6 is 3. Of course, less than or equal to. So I'm looking at option A, which is apple, as my answer. Let's go to my next page. All right, question 25. The sum of two positive numbers, P and Q, is 32. Their difference is... 12, what's a smaller number? So it means that when I add P and Q, I am going to get 32. And when I subtract P and Q, I am going to get 
well, okay. What is a smaller number? Now, there are so many ways of doing this. This looks like a typical simultaneous equation. So here's what I can do. I can add them, divide by two. All right, subtract them, divide by two. Yeah, because I want a smaller number, I'm gonna subtract them and divide it by two, right? So I'm gonna go 32 minus 12. That's gonna give me 32 minus 12 is gonna give me 20. And if I divide 20 by two, I'm gonna get 10. And if you add them and divide by two, you're gonna realize that you get a larger number. So if you were to say 32 plus 12, that's gonna be 44. If you divide 44 by 12, you're gonna get 22, right? And what is 22 plus 10? That's gonna give you 32. And what is 22 minus 10? That's gonna give you 12. So it's all up to you, depending on what they ask you for. 26, we have 3x squared multiplied by 2x cubed. Now here's where we call, or we talk about the laws of indices. So we're gonna multiply the numbers separately. Three times two is six. Hmm. Now by laws of indices, when you multiply two things with the same base, you add the powers, right? So you have two plus three. Because my powers are my exponents, or my index are two and three. So that's six x to the fifth power, which makes that option B as in board. All right, taking this down to number 27. It says two matrices A and B are compatible for multiplication A by B. All right, so whenever what they're asking you is that what makes matrix multiplication compatible? All right, so if you have like A, B, C, D, we know that if they have the same order, they are compatible. But let's look at a different order. Would this be compatible? Or would this be compatible? Hmm. That's the question we need to ask. So, remember, for our matrix to be compatible, what we well, there are several ways to look at it, right? We can say that the number of columns of the first matrix must be equal to the number of rows of the second matrix. Just like with this one, we have two columns, we have two rows. Well, in this case, we have two columns, we have one row, so this can work, right? So this here is wrong. Very important because they will ask you this even in paper too. All right, so it says the number of rows in matrix A must equal to the number of columns in matrix B. Um, the number of columns in matrix A must be equal to the number of rows in matrix B. Clear, which is what we say makes it compatible. All right, 28. The determinant of the identity matrix is now identity, which is 1, 0, 0, 1. You should know this matrix. They can ask you, what is it? We know how to find the determinant, right? So we take the leading diagonal, the product, and we subtract the product of the non leading diagonal. Now the leading diagonal is 1 times 1, which is 1. Non leading is 0 times 0, which is 0 which gives me one. So it's gonna be one, right? We didn't have to work that out because the identity matrix is unique. So, but it's good to use that as a revision. So we know, remember how to find our determinant, right? 29, it says if vector P and Q are, so this is P and the second one is Q, right? What is P minus 2Q? So you do exactly what it says. P is 3, 2, minus 2Q, and Q is negative 1, 4. Now be careful here. So we're going to have 3, negative 2, times negative 1 is positive. So we're going to have a positive 2. And then we're going to have 2 here. Negative 2 times 4 is minus 8. So that gives me 5, and 2 minus 8 is negative 6 which makes my option B as in dog. All right, we have a next vectors question coming up here in question 30, and it says refers to the parallelogram, all right? And we know what parallelograms are, right? W, X, Y, in the parallelogram, X, Y is equal to U, and pay attention to the direction, that's X, Y. 
and uh, xw is equal to v xw and the arrows are going in the same direction so that is good r is the midpoint of y z and here is y z here right so that's y z now what we know about a parallelogram is that opposite sides are equal and opposite sides are parallel so if xw is equal to v then y z is also equal to v right makes my life easier right it also means that w z is equal to u because they're opposite sides going in the same direction express in terms of u and v w r so if i'm going from w to r there are so many ways i can do it i can go from w to z so i can say w let me make sure i have this right w r is equal to w I'm going to pull this over a bit so we can see clear. WR is equal to WZ plus ZR. Now, WZ is equal to U. But look at ZR, right? R is the midpoint, so we know we're going to have to half the V. But notice that my, that my Z, it shouldn't be Z, yeah, yeah, ZR. ZR is half of ZY, right? So this is half of ZY, but ZY is the opposite direction of the arrow, which means it's going to be negative. So whenever we change the direction of a vector, it becomes negative. So it's going to be a negative, a half of V. So it's U minus a half of V, which is going to be option A. Right, to my next page. All right, it says, given that one millimeter is equal to one over a thousand meters, then 2,500 millimeters in meters is. All right, pretty good question. Hmm? What this is telling me is that 1,000 millimeters make one meter. That's just an X way of writing it, all right, as a decimal version, which means that if I have this in millimeters, all I'm going to be doing is dividing that by a thousand. And of course, you know how what happens when you divide two five by a thousand, right? Since it's three zeros, we move three places like one, two, three, which makes it 2.5 meters. This is interesting because it's just an X way of telling the same thing. All right. So you have to be careful. You have to understand your units. All right, question 32 refers to the diagram below, which shows a sector of circle AOB such that AOB is 60 degrees and OB is our unit long, the area. Now, we know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. A sector is a part of a circle. That part is determined by the angle formed here, and that angle is a part of the circle which measures 360 degrees. So we know that it's going to be 60 over 360 degrees, right? Because one complete turn is 360 times pi r squared. There's nothing to be worked out. We just need to break this down. Zeros again become powerful. 6 into 6 is 1. 6 into 36 is 6. So that's 1, 6 pi r squared. Hmm? We don't need to look further than a. Number 33, it says the volume in centimeter cube, in cubic centimeter of a cube of edges three centimeter is, and what do we know about a cube? All sides are equal, hmm? all sides are equal, so three, three, three. And the volume is equal to length cube. Hmm? So it's gonna be three times three times three, 33 is 9, and 9 times 3 is 27. It says 27 cubic centimeters. Right, easy question. These are things we should know. 35. All right. So which of the following figures, which of the following figures, not drawn to scale, has an area equal to this? Now, if I'm looking at this, we should be thinking trapezium. So, What's the formula for the area of a trapezium? 
is half a plus b times height. Now, a and b represent the parallel sides, so that's what you really need to remember. It's half the sum of the parallel sides multiplied by the perpendicular height. All right? Perpendicular means I'm looking for the right angle. So which of these diagrams has a right angle or a perpendicular height being two? There's only one, option D. I do not need to look any further. The perpendicular height, which is this height, where you see the right angle, must be two. So it just made my life pretty easy. Question 36. The area of a triangle is 53.4 square centimeter. If the length is multiplied by 4, all right, so remember now, the area of a rectangle is length times width. Length times width is equal to 53.6. Now, this value is not important. What is important is what you do to the length and the width. So the length is multiplied by 4. So 4 times the length. And the width is half times half the width. Now, whatever impact it has on the left, because it's an equation, it's going to have the same impact on the right. What do I mean? All right. Now, because we're multiplying everything here, we can practically group the four and the half, and we can group the length and the width. Now, we know that four halves basically make two. Or, if you can't, it's like that you say four into four is one. Sorry, 2 into 2 is 1, and 2 into 4 is 2. So you have 2 length width. Now, how did we impact the original equation? We are now multiplying the left-hand side by 2, which means for it to be balanced, the right-hand side must be multiplied by 2. Now, 53.6 is close to 100. That's right? close to 50. So I just multiply 50 by 2, which gives me 100. And so I'm looking for 100 and something. I do not need to do anything else because there is only one logical value here. And that's 107.2, right? So you don't actually always have to worry about the value. We can use our intuition. All right, let me go previous. Whoa, that was 36 already. All right, so we're at question number 37. All right, it says, item 37 refers to the following diagram, which shows a sector of a circle with center O, right? So we have that there. If the length of the minor arc PQ is 8 centimeters, what is the length of the circumference of the circle? Now again, this is something else to look at. The arc is a part of one complete circle. The part is determined by the angle here. All right? And if you recall, we had worked this out earlier, that this is really 1 6. So there are six equal arcs you can get out of the circle, all right? So 60 over 360. It came up earlier, so we know it was 1, 6. This length of arc represents 1, 6. One part out of six equal parts. So if I know that this is one part, then six equal parts would be six times that one part, which is six times eight, which is 48. So it's going to be 48 centimeters. Question 38. All right, going down here. The area of a triangle is 30 square centimeter and its base is 10 centimeter. What is the height of a triangle? All right, we just draw a random triangle, right? The base is 10. We want to know what the height is. And the area is, so we know that it's half times base times height, which is going to give me 30. Now look at how easy we can work this out. We say half times 10 times height is equal to 30. Good. So when I find a half of 10, I'm going to get 5. The only question I need to ask myself now is what number do I multiply 5 by to get 30? We know that 5 times 6. So all of this right here, let me use a different color. Because a half of 10 is 5. All of this is 5. So the height is whatever number I multiply 5 by to get 30, which is 6. Okay? So that makes it A as in apple. Apple, apple, apple. 39. Now let's get this down. And I'm going to have to make this smaller so it's easier to see. Right, let's go. It says the diagram refers to 
39, which shows the number of children age 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? So that there we have it. What's the modal age? Now, mode is a number that appears the most, the one that has the highest frequency, the one that most children have, right? So we look at the y axis. Now, because we're looking at bars, looking for the tallest bar, tallest bar indicates the highest frequency. This is my tallest bar. And at the base, so we come down to the base of the tallest bar to find the information, which is the age. So don't remember now, we're not looking at the 5 over here. Because this 5 is just telling me that 5 children have an age of 7. I'm interested in the age. So the age would be 7 right here, right? Next. Number 40. And number 40 says that, alright, let me take this up a bit. So this diagram is referring to 40 to 42. Alright, so we have pretty much a good amount of questions to answer from this, right? Which is a cumulative frequency curve? Or we call it, we can call it an O guide. It shows 200 marks based on the mark of 200 students, sorry. 200 students, right? So this shows the mark obtained by 200 students who took a driving test. Right, the median mark score by the 200 students is, no, median is the number in the middle, all right, halfway there, we have 200 students, so I'm going to have to find a half of that 200, which is going to give me 100, so whenever I find 100, that gives me the median mark, now if I have 80 here, and I have 120 up there, then 100 must be in the middle, because that's going to be halfway between 80 and 120, right? So we find that on the y-axis, we go across. Once we get across here, we come all the way down. Alright, I'm probably not drawing this properly. Let me get a straight line here. So we are at 100, which means we're going to go right across on that line. Once we get to that line, we come down. Right in the middle there, right? So looking here, we have 30, we're going up by one as you can see. So we have 35 in the middle, 36, 37. So we're looking at 37 and a half. Hmm, not too bad. Coming down, it says, what is the interquartile range mark of obtained by the 200 students? Now, the interquartile range, which we call IQR is equal to Q1. Our Q, sorry, Q3 minus Q1. Now, Q3, third quartile, all right? We have been talking about common fractions. Quartile, quarter. We're talking about three quarter minus a quarter, all right? So, we're talking about the data that is three quarter of the way minus the data that is a quarter of the way. Now, what I'm going to have to do to get that value is to find three quarter of 200, which we know we can ignore that 0, 4 into 20 goes 5, so that's 150, that's 3 times 5 is 15. You notice how I just put the 0 at the end, and we're going to have to find a quarter as well of 200, which 4, 1, 4 into 20 goes 5, we'll put the 0, that's 50. Now these are positions, which means that they represent the cumulative frequency. So I have to go on to the cumulative frequency chart. I'm going to have to find where I have my 50 value. 50, we go to the chart. Once we get to 50, we come down. All right, that looks like 31 and a half. So, so, so Q1 is equal to 31.5. All right, for the upper quartile, we'll go to 150, right? So we have 120 here. We're going to have 140 right here in the middle. And so 150 is going to be halfway. So that is how we look at life. If this is 120, this is 140. Between 150 and 160. Between 140 and 160, sorry. 150 is going to be halfway. So I just need to find halfway here. So halfway is going to be in here. We'll go across the graph. Once we get to the graph, we come down. 
right? These lines don't have to be perfect, right? So we have 40 here, 41, 42, 43. So we're going 43, which is the upper quartile subtract 31.5, which is the lower quartile, right? So just think of 43 minus 31. The 0.5 is not so important. That's going to be about 12 region. All right, so you don't even always have to subtract. Just an estimation is good. All right, so that's 42. And then 40, sorry, that's 41. 42 is also dependent on this. It says if 38% of the students test, if 38% of the students pass the test, what was the pass mark? All right, so 38% of the students pass. Now, I know that 38% is close to 40. So what do you think I'm gonna have to do? I'm simply gonna find 40, because I need to know what basically um, out of the 200 students, right? How much students pass? And it says if 38% of the students pass a test, what was the pass mark? I just need to know how many students pass. No, I'm not going to find 38% of 200. 40 is close. I'm going to find 40% of 200. So 40 over 100 times 200. Right? Take out the zeros. Now, this is saying that 80 students pass. Which means that if we look at the graph here, I am at 200. I'm going to subtract 80 because guess what the persons who pass will be up here because these are the persons up here that will give you the higher marks right so if i subtract 80 from 200 it gives me 120 all right or i just subtract 8 from 12 sorry 8 from 20 that's going to give me 12 when i add by the zero so that's going to give me 120 so i just need to find 120 go right across to 120 and once i come down I'm going to get the passing mark. Now, if I look carefully here, this is telling me that the pass mark is 40. So my answer is B, as in boy. Question 43. It says, the following table shows the frequency of scores obtained in a test. Now, the scores are up here. And the number of students are down here. Now, notice this part is just for frequency. The actual scores are at the top of the table. That is what is the most important. Now, the range is, which is the highest value, subtract the lowest value. And we're talking about the scores. The highest score here is 10, and the lowest score is 2. So, the 10 minus 2 is 8. So, that is C as in cat. All right. We're now at item 44, which refers to the following refers to the following two way table which shows the mode of transportation to school on a particular day for a group of 200 students all right so this is telling me that you have male you have females they're looking at males and females separately and how they go to school all right so we have persons taking bus 30 males take bus 44 females take bus 50 males take taxi 16 females take taxi looking at the walking um 28 males walk, 32 females walk. Now, this 108 right here is actually reflecting the total amount of males. This 92 is reflecting the total amount of females. Now, notice that 92 plus 108 is 200. Hmm? All right, good. A male student is picked at random from the group. So, we're focusing on males, right? And males, we have 108 males. Now, what is the probability that he does not walk to school? All right, good. Now, if he doesn't walk, it means that he either takes a bus or he takes a taxi. Make sense? Good. So, we have limited, instead of looking at the whole entire 200, we're focusing specifically on the males, which we have 108 males. All right, so that's my total. So that's going to be my denominator there. Now, the probability that he does not walk to school means that he's going to either be bus or taxi. Now, how many persons take bus? 30. How many persons take taxi? 
50. We're talking about the males here. Now, since it's telling that a male was selected, that is why my sample space becomes the amount of males that I have. I'm not looking at everyone because I know specifically that a male was selected. So it doesn't become a probability of 200 because we already know it's a male. So that is why we have 108 down here. So this becomes 30 plus 50, which is 80 over 108. All right. Now, I'm going to have to break this down. Let me get my thing right here. We have a 80 over 108. Now, persons might say, uh, this might be challenging to break down. Not necessarily. Um, start off with numbers like 2. 2 into 8 is 40. 2 into 108. 2 into 10 is 5. 2 into 8 is 4. 54, right? Still can go down by 2. 2 into 40 is 20. 2 into 54, we say 2 into 5 is 2, carry the 1, 2 into 14 is 7. So it's 20 out of 27, which we know can't go any further. Alright, question 45. Which of the following graph represents, which of the following represents the graph of a function? Alright, now. Where functions are concerned, it only needs to pass a vertical line test. Hmm? And if we look at this carefully, we can see that this is a straight line. And we know that straight lines are a function, so we don't need to go any further. So if I draw a vertical line, it should only cut it once. And there is only one option here that allows the graph to be cut once with a vertical line. And that's option A for us. So luckily, we don't have to go any further, right? Alright, so we are now going up to 46 functions. And it says if f of x is equal to 2x squared minus 1, then f of minus 3. So I just simply need to replace that x with minus 3. So I'm going to have 2, open bracket, minus 3, all squared, minus 1. Remember your laws of bid mass. Alright, so I go, I don't need, want to spend a lot of time doing this because we, we have done it so many times. We're going to have to go negative 3 times negative 3. Let me just put by the bracket here. Which we know negative times negative is positive. So I'm going to get 9 times 2. Which we have to do first before we subtract. Which is 18 minus 1. Which we know is 17, right? Now item 47 refers to the following graph of a straight line. Now what is it asking me? The straight line cuts AB cuts the y-axis at. So this is my y-axis. Now remember, when looking at where the graph cuts the y-axis, I have to look at the x-coordinate first, which is 0 coming down, and the y-coordinate is negative 2. So I'm looking for 0, negative 2. Now the equation of the line which passes through the point 0, 5 and has a gradient of 4 is. Now remember how we do equation, y equal to mx plus c. M is my gradient. My gradient here is 4. So that's 4x plus C. C is my y-intercept. That is where the graph cuts the y-axis. Now where the graph cuts the y-axis, my x value is 0. So I know that 5 is where my graph cuts the x, the y-axis, sorry, because my x value is 0. So this becomes 4x plus 5. So y is equal to 4x plus 5, C, as in cat. 49. The range of f such that x maps on to x cube for the domain is cube, which means that you multiply each number by itself three times. So you have negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, which negative times negative is positive 8 times negative 2, positive times negative. Oh, my bad. Let me fix this. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. And positive 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. So it has to be an option with negative 8. Alright, see so I wrote the wrong thing again. It's 4 times negative 2, which is negative 8. D as in dog. We don't need to go any further. Alright. The values of x are which equation y equal 4x squared minus x squared intersect y equals 0 is. So first of all, I need to find out what is y equal to 0. 
y equal to 0 is a line that passes through 0 on the y-axis, and there's only one line that does that for us, and that is the x-axis. So it's just a different way of asking me, where does this graph for the x-axis? Because the x-axis is at 0 and at 4 for sure. So I'm looking for 0 and 4. Wow, A, I don't have to go any further. Okay, so we're supposed to use this to answer two questions, 50 and 51. The coordinate of the turning point. So let me pull the graph up. Turning point is where the graph turns. There is no easier way to explain it, which is right here. All right, I want the coordinate, which I'm looking at the x value first, which is 2, then the y value, which is 4. All right, so we're looking for 2, 4, which makes this D as in dog. And let's scroll this down. All right, we're looking at 52. Now, which of the following pairs of lines is perpendicular? And here's an iron. There's a pretty easy way to know which is perpendicular. What you can do, just as a smart guess, is just look for the two lines where you notice the x and y values actually made a swap, right? So if you look at the first equation, you notice you had 2 in front of the y. And if you look at the second equation, you have about the 2 in front of the y. If you look at x, the values are still there. So now, because when the lines are perpendicular, the gradient of one is the negative reciprocal of the other one. So I, I know that this is not it. Here the gradients are the same, which means that they are parallel. That is absolutely not it. All right, coming down. Good. Notice that swap right here. That 4 that was in front of the x is now in front of the y. So right away, in my mind, I know that this is what I am looking at. Right? Option C. So we're looking for the option where we notice that the x and the y, the coefficients of x and y, switches. So what was in front of the x is now in front of the y, and what is now in front of the y is now in front of the x. Remember, it's a negative reciprocal, so of course the signs will be different. That is how we do it. We don't even have to work that out. But if you feel uncomfortable with that, we we'll put it in the form y equal to mx plus c. The first equation is there already. This one, I would have to divide by 4, right? So I would have 4y is equal to x plus 1. We divide both sides by 4. So we have y equal. And if we separate this, we have a quarter x plus a quarter. Right? So we have that negative reciprocal right here. But as I said, a shortcut. Look for the one where you see the coefficients sweep switches <laughs> are swapped. Alright, question 53. Now when looking at this, the only thing I need to think of is I'm looking in front of a mirror. Because this is like looking in a mirror, right? Where you have that lateral inversion effect. So whenever you have two things looking at each other just like that, you're just thinking, of what if there is a mirror right in front of us? We, we always use our mirrors, so we know that this is what happens when we look in a mirror. So sometimes we have to use real life to do whatever we're doing, right? This is me looking inside a mirror. So I know that it's going to be a reflection. All right? All right. I move to my next question, which is question 54. And it says, item 54 refers to the following diagram. Now, one of the things that we must always pay attention to is those marking on the triangles. Those markings are telling me that those two sides are the same length, which means that the base angles are the same, right? So that's 30 degrees as well. So once the sides are the same, the base angles become the same, which means that angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees, and these two combine to give me 60 degrees, which means if I subtract 18, subtract 6 is 12, we put back the 0, we're looking at x being 120 degrees. Now, item 55 refers to the transverse diagram, or transversal, which, in which the lines A, B, and C, D are parallel, right? So these are parallel lines, and we have this transversal line that cuts it. Now, to make life easy, there are certain things that we use to remember, right? So for example, my alternate angles, all I have to remember is my Z. If I can find Z, 
or if I can find my z angles, I found my alternate angles. And guess what? My z angles are the same. So it means that my x angle is the same as my y angle. Very good. Question number 56. All right, it says item 56 refers to the following pair of similar triangles. All right, similar triangles, which means that the sides are connected by a constant ratio. What do I mean by that? All right, these two sides are proportional, right? As you can see, they both represent the leg of the perpendicular. So it means that whatever I multiply 3 by to get 6, I'm also going to multiply this side well, the hypotenuse by to get 7, right? Because those are the two matching sides. So it's saying MO in centimeters. I'm looking at MO. So since 3 is half of 6, MO, which is this side, is also half of 3. Half of 7, sorry. And what is half of 7? Half of 7 is 3.5, right? So we're connected by a constant ratio. Once you find the sides that much, the ratio between them is constant. All right, the image of this point under translation. This is probably what's the translating vector. So the image of the point under translation is that. So in other words, how does the translating vector work? We take the point, which is P, which is 1, 2. We add it to the translating vector, so plus, And we get the object. All right, I'm saying that incorrectly. All right. This is my object and this is my image. So I take my object, which is one, two, I add it to my translating vector, call it T. I'm gonna put X and Y there, and I get my image, which is negative five, negative four. Good. So my question is what do I add to one to get negative five? It must be negative six. And what do I add to two? To get negative 4. It must also be negative 6. So I know that this is going to be negative 6, negative 6. If I don't feel comfortable with that, all I have to do is to take my object and subtract it from my image. So I have negative 5, negative 4, and I'm going to subtract 1 and 2. Right? Negative 5 minus 1 is negative 6. Negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. That's me. All right, we're almost there, guys. Almost there. All right, item 58 refers to the following diagram. We can see A, B, C. We can see what's going on, right? Now, reading through all of this, it says that O, A, A prime, O, B, D prime and O, C are straight lines connecting A, B, C onto A prime, B prime, C prime, which is an enlargement to the center O. What's the scale factor? Now look at A, B, C. Look at A prime, C prime, D prime. You can practically say it's doubled, right? So we know that the scale factor has to be 2. Now, if we don't know that that is true, we just simply need to look at corresponding sides that we can easily find the length of. This here is 2 unit, 1, 2. This is 1, 2, 3, 4. So I multiplied by 2. Now, of course, are you saying that did we multiply by negative 2? Did we multiply by positive 2? Notice that the image falls directly in front of the object, which means we must have multiplied by a positive 2. Right? That's one way to look at it. All right. If it had fallen behind, then of course that would be a different thing, right? All right, 59, a plane is flying in a direction 45 degrees, 0, 4, 5 degrees, and that's a bearing, right? 0, 4, 5, change its course to 1, 3, 5, right? 1, 3, 5, so that, remember it's measured away from the north. Bearings are measured away from the north. So it turns bearing in a clockwise direction to 1, 3, 5 degrees. The angle to which the plane turns, so 1, 3, 5 is coming all the way from up here. So 1, 3, 5. So the angle to which it turns is in between, which means I'm going to have to go 1, 3, 5. And I'm going to have to subtract 
my 45 degrees hmm? which of course 100 minus 45 or 135 minus 45 and you know exactly what to do here is 0 4 from 13 is 9 this is going to give me turn through 90 degrees so you basically turn to a right angle then and my finale question is this question number 6 refers the diagram not drawn to scale shows that the angle of depression is 30 degrees of a point x from z so it shows an angle of depression now what is it about angle of depression and elevation that also comes in handy alternate angles do you see my z angle right here very important it means down here is also 30 degrees all right if x is 10 meters from y the height yz so i want to find this this is what i want to find is so you want to use something now that involves this angle this side and that side which clearly for me is a tan all right now let's see tan 30 degrees is equal to my opposite which is zy over my adjacent which is 10 so this becomes if i cross multiply by 10 i get 10 tan 30 is equal to zy all right so we didn't have to work it out because we knew that tan is the only ratio that deals with opposite and adjacent all right not something i had to work out but just to show you so you have the knowledge that's how we would have worked it out all right now this brings us to the end of our paper